I, I wanted to ask a question as we got started. How much do you plan your schedule around the weather forecast? We we look at it. That's one of the things that Cindy and I do every morning. Was we'll we'll watch Channel Seven at least get through the weather. Uh, Mo Chamel. Uh, we people have their favorite forecasters. I, I know a lot of people like Joel Barnes. Uh, I like his vests, but. Um, some people look at some forecasters as more reliable than others, have a better track record than others. You, you, you compare them sometimes, and you, you don't always get the same forecast. And you find yourself leaning more towards the one who either gives you the forecast you want to hear or the forecast that is more accurate more, more of the time. Um, I found it interesting in the Gospel of Matthew, and, and, and I'm, I'm just going to take you to this first before I, 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 we look at Mark 13. Jesus and Mark and Matthew 16 made this observation about weathermen. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. And then he says, You hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky. But you cannot discern the signs of the times. We, uh, we, we plan a lot of our lives around the weather. And he says, Jesus was saying, you guys, you, you, you look at the weather, you know how to plan your day. But you're not looking at the signs of the times. And in Mark 13 tonight, we're going to be looking at Jesus talking to his disciples about the signs of the times. Uh, we may not put a great deal of stock in forecasts unless the source is reliable. Um, the Bible is reliable, and the Bible has a great track record for accuracy when it comes to uh, prophecy. When you look in the Old Testament, you'll find over at least over a hundred different prophecies that relate to Jesus in his birth or his life or his death and resurrection. And uh, the Old Testament shows the, the prophecies, the New Testament shows the fulfillment. We have this record of reliability. Uh, the New Testament is full of verses foretelling His second coming. And they are just as reliable. And they are just as accurate. And just because they haven't happened yet, there are some who say, well, where is, the, where is His coming since, the, you know, the days before, nothing has ever really changed and doesn't look like everything, anything ever will. And yet, the New Testament is very reliable. Jesus is one of its sources. Um, we're looking at Mark 13. I just want to let you know that in, in three of the Gospels, Matthew 21, Mark 13, and Luke 21, they all speak about Jesus sharing with his disciples about end times. Uh, and for the most part, Mark and Matthew are pretty well in sync with one another. So let's look at it, and I want you to see that as he begins to talk about it, there are some things that were applicable to the people he was talking about that day. There were some things that would be more applicable to people in the distant future. But I think we want to make sure what we are clear on tonight is what is applicable for us. Beginning in verse 1, he says, Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And they were talking about there in Jerusalem and the temple itself. And verse 2 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that was a prophecy. And verse 3 says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple... Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately. And he asked them two questions. Now, I want you to note these two questions because when he answers, he, the, the, the answers are to the questions, but the questions aren't about the same thing. They first asked, because of his comments about the temple, uh, tell us, when will these things be? And then they asked the question, and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Well, the fulfillment of the temple coming down was less than 40 years away. 
there somewhere around 33 AD. Temple comes down in 70 AD, 37 years later from the time this is being shared, that temple is coming down. And so uh, there was a prophecy for them that was pretty imminent. But the rest of what he has to say here from verses 5 through 13, I think also refers to their time. I want you to look at this with me because he makes this response, first of all, not to all of the men, but to these four who have come asking the question. Jesus answering them began to say, look at verse 5, Take heed that no one deceives you. And he's talking to these, these men. Many will come in my name saying I am he and will deceive many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. And these are the beginning of sorrows. We'll come back to that part in verse 8 a little bit later. But uh, what he's saying is that the end times are about to, to, to come begin. And unlike what you are thinking from the triumphal entry, and everybody was looking for it to be the beginning of the of the peace, of the good times. Jesus gives them just the opposite. He says, the end times will grow from bad to worse. And they were already living in a time of oppression, and, and, and Rome was, was not only occupying, uh, as I said, in less than 40 years, they're going to destroy everything they knew concerning the temple. They were going to come in and sweep clean again most of the disciples would still be living by that time. He continues with kind of a general, with general statements of how the world will continue to, to progress into turmoil. Now was not the time for the peace they were anticipating or expecting him to bring when he was brought into Jerusalem that week. Now was not that time for peace. They were going to be going through some very difficult times. Verse 9. Watch out for yourselves. And notice the things that he says about them. They will deliver you up to councils. You will be bitten, beaten in the synagogues. Those are things that we saw already in the early chapters of Acts, right after the resurrection, right after the ascension. Uh, as Peter and them began to preach, we saw them arrested. We saw them brought up before the council. We, brought, we saw them beaten. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, don't worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. Whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. I and then he says, Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. You say, I, I, I thought this was just about the end times. It is, but it was beginning at that point, and these men were about to go through much of this. It refers to how they need to prepare themselves for the persecution that is about to begin against the followers of Jesus. These are verses that speak more of persecution than tribulation. We're going to get into the difference in just a second, but the persecution is going to be real, and the, pers- and the Christian is not going to be exempt from persecution. And I think if there's anything we draw from this particular passage, this is going to be part of it. Uh, there's a lot who don't want to see Christians suffer at all. Well, i, I got bad news for you. They already are. And they're suffering throughout the world. We may not see the kind of physical persecution that is being experienced in other countries, but it is happening as we speak tonight. And so it began as early as those early chapters of Acts. And I think this is part of what he was warning them for. Prepare yourselves for the persecution that's about to begin against the followers of Jesus. You will be arrested. You will be thrown out of the synagogue. You will be persecuted. You'll be brought before the council, and you'll have to give testimony about your faith. As we've been going through the book of Acts on Sunday mornings, the life of Saul before he became Paul speaks of this level of persecution, where families were put in fear for their lives. 
Acts, for example, Acts chapter 9, and I'll just throw a couple of these out. You've got them in your notes as to, to where I'm referring to, and you can check them later. But I, let me just read it for you. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of, and we've talked about this before, the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul was very much a part of this persecution. And then he had that uh, Damascus Road experience that we talked about last Sunday uh, and gave him a whole new testimony, a whole new life so that later Paul would become on the receiving end of the persecution. And you remember how just a couple weeks ago we began to talk about what he was telling the church at Philippi, all the things that he went through because of, of, of being, you know, uh, a follower of Jesus Christ, how he had been scourged, how he had been stoned, how he had been left for dead, how he had been shipwrecked, all these things. All this happened in just the first few decades of the church. Because persecution was part of the plan. You say, why do you say part of the plan? Because if you remember, he, he told them to get out of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. They didn't get out of Jerusalem until Acts chapter 8, verse 1, after the stoning of Stephen. It took persecution to move the church. It took persecution for the church to get serious about what it was they were entrusting themselves to and what they were preaching. That's why I say it was part of the plan in that respect. Uh, it wasn't just something that God allowed. It was something that God knew was going to happen because of their stance with the world. Jesus told him, he says, the world, don't think the world's going to love you. The world's going to hate you. They hate me. You think they're going to love you? So persecution was a part of what they were going to face. They would be brought before the council, and as a result... The church would go through persecution, but not, uh, but not go through God's tribulation. This is the next part of what he's getting ready to talk about. And I think it's important for us to, to separate these two concepts. The church will not go through the tribulation, but they will go through persecution. And it started even as early as when the church first got started. Jesus tried to warn him. Go back to your text, verse 14. So when you see the abomination of desolation, that comes from the book of Daniel, by the way. A king sacrificed a pig on the altar, and it was referred to as the, uh, the abomination of desolation. Something like that's going to happen again. It's going to happen in the temple. And it's going to happen in, in the part of the, of the period of time that we're going to refer to as the tribulation. And as such, the church will go through persecution, but they won't go through the tribulation. The tribulation, if you'll notice here, he says, let the reader understand. I, I, I kind of, that made me do a double take. It tells me that what he is sharing is going to be written and what he's writing is going to be read and what he's reading and what people will read in the future, they will have to have an understanding for it. And so... This marks the teaching that was to be passed on for future generations. For it was to be written and read by others, not just those that were present when it was spoken. Let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now we're talking about the future. Uh, the book of Revelation is going to carry more details of what this tribulation looks like after the, the abomination of desolation stands in the temple. But this has to be the future because the temple is going to be destroyed in less than 40 years. And for this to happen, it's going to have to happen in a different temple. And that's what makes it something that is in the future. And so Jesus is not giving a chronological account at this point. I want you to see in, in, that even what we're reading is not a chronological account of the end of times. It's just kind of snapshots of different parts of it. And in some respects, Mark is even putting them in, in not reverse order, but he's putting the tribulation and the second coming before another event that will come before them. 
He begins with the tribulation and he begins with that and the second coming when he goes on in verse 15 and says, Let him who is on the housetop not go down when this takes place and the abomination of desolation takes place and they realize that they have been, been deceived. Let him who is on the housetop not come down into the house nor enter and take anything out of, the, out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to his own clothes. Uh, go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. Verse 19, for in those days there will be tribulation. And that's where we get the expression. This is a time of tribulation. This is a time of great tribulation. In fact, Jesus says, such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. When we use the expression tribulation, we're talking about a time where God is pouring His wrath out upon the world. He's pouring His, much like He did with Egypt, His plagues. And His wrath is being poured out on the world. And He's going to say that uh, uh, unless the Lord had shortened those days, unless he, he had even made that a shorter period of time, nobody would have survived. Nobody would survive. No flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake whom he chose, he shortened the days. And if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, he's there, do not believe him. And then he talks about the false Christ and false prophets. You have the Antichrist, and you have the false prophet will rise up. They will show signs and wonders. Again, the book of Revelation unpacks this a little bit more in detail. Jesus is giving snapshots. There will become a time where there will be this great tribulation. It will begin with this uh, abomination of desolation that will take place in the temple. That, by the way, it will be different from the one that we're standing in front of now because uh, that one's going to be destroyed in about 37 years. And it's going to be that far in the future that they're going to have to have another temple. And when that happens... There's going to be those that will rise up and will deceive many. There will be an antichrist, a false prophet. He'll show signs and wonders. He'll deceive and, if possible, even the elect. But take heed and see that I told you all these things beforehand. In those days, and now he's going to talk about after the tribulation, verse 24. In those days, talking about in the future, after that tribulation... The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars of heaven will fall, the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And this is the second coming. He says, I'm coming back. And he makes it perfectly clear it's going to be a time of great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. And he begins explaining what will happen to the disciples in that day. Now, he's going to back up just a little bit. He, after explaining what will happen to the, to the disciples, first of all, in the immediate future with the, with the uh, destruction of the temple, then showing what, will end, what the end will look like in the distant future with the uh, uh, tribulation and the coming of Jesus... He backs up to the point where the future generations can know what to look for. The signs of the times, and that's what this is, is kind of about for us, are pointing to two different events, but they, they begin with a single event. And that's the next passage, verse 28. Before the tribulation, before the second coming, there's going to be another event. And that event is marked by the parable of the fig tree. He says in verse 28 and following, learn this parable from the fig tree. Now the fig tree has become representative of Israel. And he's already shared with them that, that the temple is going to be destroyed. Everything they know is going to be taken away from them and they're going to be finding themselves scattered just like they have in the past in the other, in, in the other exiles. And they're going to be blown to the wind, but they're going to come back together. He says, when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Verse 29, so you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. In other words, there's going to be an event that's going to begin to cause everybody to look for the end to be coming. And it is the 
coming back of Israel back into their own homeland to be re reformed as the nation of Israel. He says, Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. All the things we've just talked about. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The parable of the fig tree speaks of that time when Israel will once again be recognized as its own country. I trust you have heard that that took place in 1948. 1,900 years after he prophesied it, that Israel would come back together, that there would be a budding of the fig tree, it took place. And that is the event that begins to usher in the proximity of not just the tribulation, not just the second coming, but something else. And it's that something else that involves you and I. You see, his immediate context, his immediate prophecy was for them that was listening. That which was written would be shared with those that would come in the future. But that which you and I need to be thinking about and looking at with great detail is what is about to come next. You see, when he talks about the fig tree, he says, uh, from that point on, the signs of Christ's return will begin to grow in frequency and intensity. There have always been wars and rumors of wars. There have always been earthquakes. There have always been famines. There have always been pestilence. But as, they, as we approach the end of times, they are going to become more numerous and they are going to become more frequent and they're going to become more intense. And that's why he's saying things are going to not get better. They're just going to go from bad to worse until they get to a tribulation, which nobody would survive if, we didn't, if God didn't shorten the time it was going to be in. But now, once this generation begins to see the coming of Israel back to its homeland, be watching. And the intensity and the frequency with it, which these signs start to grow, the Bible calls birth pangs. Um, you'll remember back in verse 8, it says, these are the beginning of sorrows. That word sorrows there is in, in more of a, of a reference toward the delivery process. You remember when, what, what God told Eve when, after the sin? She, he said, I'm going to multiply your, your uh, sorrow in childbirth. In sorrow you will bring forth. And that became part of the birthing process understanding. It was a time, and even Jesus would say, when someone, when a, when a woman gives birth, it's a time of sorrow until she hears the baby, and then it's a time of rejoicing, and she forgets all the sorrow. He says, when you start seeing these times, these are the beginnings of sorrows. Paul says in Romans 8, 22, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. In other words, the signs of the end have always been a part of history, but at the end times they will grow in intensity and frequency as they lead to the time of the great revelation, I mean the great tribulation. But before that happens, Mark 13, 32 through 37, before that happens, there is a second, not second coming, but a second appearing. You say, well, what do you mean by second appearing? Jesus is coming, but not to the earth. He's coming to the sky. He's coming to call the church to himself and to call it the church home before the tribulation. You say, well, that's, that's sure is wishful thinking, preacher. No, it's God's pattern. Before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he got Lot and those out. While there was the plagues being there upon Egypt, those in the land of Goshen were, were, were protected and spared. When God's judgment hits, God protects God's people. When Noah, when God brought judgment upon the whole world, he put Noah and his family in the ark, and he separated them from the judgment. Uh, Peter will come along and say they were saved by, by water. That wasn't baptism. That which destroyed the world lifted them up above it. As a result, God has always had this pattern of protecting His people during His judgment upon the world. And 
this is going to be no different. Look at verse 32. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. This is important. He's not talking about the second coming. He's talking about what we have commonly referred to as the rapture. And I know that people say, well, but the word rapture doesn't appear in Scripture. Yes, it does. You just don't know Latin. <laughs> it's like a man going to a far country who left his house, gave authority to his servants, and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly, and that's important, coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all. And this is where he ends with this just declarative warning. Watch. This is what he's saying to us. Watch. You see, the signs of Christ's return will include the tribulation, but before that takes place, Christ will remove his bride from the earth and carry her to himself. It's called the rapture. Or if you knew Latin, caught up. Because that's what the word in 1 Thessalonians 4 for caught up is in Latin, rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. I know you know these verses, but it, it, it really, and I, I particularly want to share this one because of what it says at the end. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's talking about death. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, the dead. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who are dead. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of the Lord of, of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That's the word rapture. If you ever wonder where we got the word rapture, it's from that expression right there. Be caught up together with them. Where? In the clouds. Why in the clouds? To meet the Lord. Where? In the air. Because he doesn't come to the earth yet. You see, we're going to see in, in Zechariah, Jesus says that when he comes again, he's going to land his feet on the Mount of Olives. And the mountain is going to split east and west. He's not coming to earth at this time. We will meet him in the air. And so that's where he says, and thus we sh will, shall always be with the Lord. And then verse 18 is what I like about this. So comfort one another with these words. Believers should draw comfort from this news. Draw comfort from, from the, the understanding that he's not going to leave us here in the midst of his own judgment upon this earth. He's going to carry us away. You say, well, that's really nice thinking. I'm glad you think that way. Uh, uh, you just don't want to go through, through any suffering. No, I've already said not going through the tribulation doesn't mean you're not going to suffer. Persecution is going to be what we will face. Paul explains in his second letter what this appearing, and I call it the second appearing, of Jesus is really for. You see, the rapture isn't just to protect us from the tribulation. In some respects, it's going to bring it on. You say, why do you say that? Because... The second appearing is for the purpose of removing his bride from the earth before the great tribulation, but that's also removing his influence. When Paul wrote the book of 2 Thessalonians, he made this statement, which explains the reason for the rapture. He said in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together, we ask you, not to be soon shaken in mind and troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. There were some that were already saying, well, no, Jesus has already come. No. Paul says, no, he hasn't. Now, you'll know when he comes. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first 
and the man of sin is revealed. That's the Antichrist. That's going to be during the time of the tribulation, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, and that's the abomination of desolation. And then look at verse 5. This is so important. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining? What does he mean by restraining? Now you know what is restraining. What's... In other words, and, and, and this has been a horrible week, absolutely horrible week. When we hear the news, when we watch the, the, the reports and we see the body cam, and we know people who know these people, this has been a horrible week. But imagine how horrible it would be if God didn't have his hand still on this earth. Do you realize that in the midst of all the, all the chaos that we see going on around us, that God has still got His Holy Spirit restraining how much worse it could be? That's what He's referring to when He says, Know what is restraining, that He may be revealed in His own time. That who may be revealed in His own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only, and get this part, he who now restrains. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He who now restrains. The presence of God upon this earth acting upon men. He who now restrains. He who dwells in every believer is actually holding back what the devil would love to unleash on this earth. When he who now restrains, he will do so until he is taken out of the way. How is he taken out of the way? He will remove himself and he will take us with him. That our presence, the presence of believers on this earth, is actually a more subduing element to what things are could be going on right now, but there will come a time when we will be removed. And God help those that are still here. You think it's bad now. Then the lawlessness, then the lawless one will be revealed. After we are taken out of the way, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. See, after we've been removed, Jesus is still coming. And when he comes, he will completely destroy the work of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. We've talked about it. Others have talked about it. What do you think the world's going to say when all of a sudden all the Christians disappear? Another pandemic? Aliens? Whatever explanation they give for our disappearance, it will be a lie. And people will believe it. That's what he's saying. But they will be given a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, when the Holy Spirit's removed from the affairs of the earth, he takes the church with him and leaves the world to experience utter chaos, and that is the tribulation followed by the second coming. So you see what I'm saying? He, he talks about the tribulation and the second coming, but then he backs it up and he says, but all of this is going to start with something. It's going to start with the fig tree. And once that happens, you watch. You keep your eyes on the eastern sky. And all of the signs that you have heard about that have been going on since the dawn of time, with wars and rumors of wars and pestilence, all of these things, they're just going to get worse and worse. Has this world ever known a disease that has affected every country at the same time that COVID did? 
I mean, I, I'm not sure that even the bubonic plague had the global impact that we have seen in this pestilence. Paul describes the event as being sudden and being devi uh, dis not divisive, decisive. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, we will be changed. He's talking about the event we just talked about in 1 Thessalonians. This corruptible will put on incorruption, this mortal will put on immortality. So when the corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus described this event in the Gospels in Matthew and Luke. In Matthew, he put it this way, For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. I told you Noah was one of the examples and, and, and one of the, the figures of why this is going to take place. They did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And then you've heard this before. Two men will be in a field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken, the other will be left. Watch, therefore. Matthew says the same thing. Mark says, watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and, all, and not allowed his house to be broken into. He would have gotten his house in order. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Luke put it this way, and I, I, I like what Luke says because I think this is significant. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. And two women will be grinding together, same as Matthew says. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two men will be in the field, same as Matthew says. One will be taken, one will be left. Did it occur to you that some people are working and some people are sleeping? That this is a global event? That part of the world is going to be at work and part of the world is going to be asleep? Because it's a global event. And as such... The rapture will take place before the tribulation. The tribulation will take place before Jesus returns to the earth. And that is the second coming when he comes to reign. And again, you go to the book of Revelation, you find, you find the picture of Jesus at the throne. You find the, you find the picture of Jesus uh, reigning. Uh, the lamb has become a lion in the book of Revelation. Revelation 7, 9, 10 has always been one of my favorite passages as a missionary because it talks about every uh, nation, tribe, people, and tongue. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hand, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Let me close with something I heard uh, David Jeremiah shared last year when we were uh, at our conference in Pigeon Forge. Uh, uh, David Jeremiah made comment that his wife comes with him on these occasions and these Bible things. She loves to come to Pigeon Forge because Pigeon Forge is full of Christmas stores. And his wife loves Christmas stores. He says, she'll come and she'll just fill up the trunk with nothing more than more Christmas stuff. And I, in our house, it begins at the end of October. As soon as, as, soon as Halloween's over, we start laying out Christmas. And I see the signs of Christmas all through my house, all through the month of November, all through the month of December. And everything points to Christmas. And he says, it, it, it's... It's obvious that Christmas is coming because I see the signs. But then it hits me. Before Christmas comes, there's Thanksgiving. We're going to eat. There will never be a Christmas without Thanksgiving first. And he says, you know what that reminds me? That all the signs are pointing to the time when Jesus is coming again 
But before he comes, there's going to be a thanksgiving. There's going to be a rapture. And we're going to be united with him to a banquet table of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's going to be glorious. As sure as there is Christmas, there is Thanksgiving. So brothers, sisters, as sure as Jesus is coming again, there's going to be a rapture. Comfort one another with these words. Jesus is coming soon, amen? amen. But he's coming sooner for us. Amen? Let's pray.